Okay, so let me see if I'm on camera. Just look at the thing and see if I'm on the camera. Am I good? You're good. Okay, so we left off um, the other day, and I had mentioned. Well, can we get make sure we get the whole board so we like refer into it? Yes. Like, all right, good. Uh, we we stopped off talking about the lost generation. I want to review that a little bit. That is the uh, we remember we discussed it. Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Faulkner, Gertrude Stein, most of them aren't even living in America. They're in Paris. It's a reaction to World War I, morally, um, that maybe there are no morals and they were lost. Um, you guys in uh, Miss Ray's class will end up reading, um, I don't think you'll read Farewell to Arms, but I know you'll read Gatsby, and you'll probably read a little bit of Faulkner. Um, uh, T.S. Eliot is a poet who comes to the lost generation. And these people are all working together and they know each other real well. In fact, they're giving each other their literature before it's published. So a lot of it has a real ring of sort of a moralistic uh, ambiguity to it. Um, so, and that's been on the test several times. We talked about Frank Lloyd Wright. So, um, and I'm going to let you go ahead and review on your own the culture of the 20s. So let's go ahead and get to the politics of the 20s. So on your packet, you can see um, the election of 1920, which we've already done before. But if you can see it up here in the election of 1920, um, we have James Cox as a Democrat, who, as everyone knows, the most important part about James Cox was his vice presidential candidate was FDR, which is the most important thing you'll have to know for this class ever. And then the Republican was Harding and Coolidge. Remember, Wilson um, had become unpopular after the war. Um, the Republicans had taken over Congress in 1918. And um, there's this new feeling, well, the war's over, we want to change. And Harding basically ran, remember, his return on normalcy campaign, which wasn't even a word. But the two big parts of his campaign, what he wanted foreign policy-wise was isolationism. Right? This is the sort of the continuation of the uh, irreconcilable senators that we talked about. Um, um, what's his name, the guy from Massachusetts? Lodge, Henry Cavill Lodge. Um, and then domestically, laissez-faire capitalism. So let's talk about um, a little bit about his early administration, and then we're going to break down the first part with isolationism, and then we'll get into um, the laissez-faire part. And we already know a lot of this, because the same thing we're talking about laissez-faire, we're talking about those old guard Republicans, right? These are the old guard Republicans getting power, right? The ones that were controlling Taft when the Republicans split in 1912, and now um, they're coming to power. So um, the first thing I want to talk about with Harding is what's happening right after, right after the war. Um, well, one thing is um, the Interstate Commerce Commission, which you know, was started in the 1880s, uh, pledged to really control railroads. Uh, Roosevelt, really, and then Wilson continuously tried to make sure the railroads and public transportation were in the public domain, were part of the public, and we had, as a government, some sort of control of them. The 1920s presidents, all right, um, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, and Mr. Field says the best way to remember them is it's, um, what is it? Hard to be cool. It's hard to be cool when you suck, all right? Harding to be Coolidge when you suck as Hoover is a vacuum. All right. Um, early on, though, um, they tried to privatize, and they, like, the Interstate Commerce Commission basically becomes uh, pro-business, which it wasn't originally going to be pro-business, but it was pro-business. Um, um, in fact, the government isn't almost pro-business, like to say, I'm going to stay out of business. It's almost, what can I do to help business in the face of labor? Remember, um, if you're in a union, that means you weren't American, right? You were obviously communist, and the only way that you really wanted to be an American was to be pro-business and, and be out on your own and, and, and no relationship to, to unions. Remember, right after the war, we had the Seattle strike we talked about, we had the United Mine Workers strike we talked about, the steel strike, and then the police strike, um, where, which is where Coolidge becomes famous. So this is sort of the aftermath. You know, we've talked about the Red Scare. Um, there were uh, race riots in Chicago because of the migration during World War I. Um, the Veterans Bureau was established. So like you've heard of the VA, um, that, that starts after World War I. Um, the um, uh, Veterans for War, the VFW starts after uh, World War I. So you get a lot of really sort of ultra-patriotic, almost nationalistic groups. And this is all in response to what happens in the war. It's not because of something, it's in response to something, right? Um, and the Red Scare is sort of the backdrop for all of this um, as a way of a control mechanism. 
So Harding, Harding didn't even want to run for president. His wife wanted him to be president. And Harding might be the worst president ever. But the funny part about it is his approval ratings, and they didn't really have official approval ratings, but they had sort of early forms of it. Harding was extraordinarily popular. In fact, um, when he died in 1923 um, in San Francisco on a speaking tour, when he died, he was very popular. But he was also, his, his administration didn't do much. In fact, it overlooked lots of scandals. And, and, and historically, we look at his scandals and what's going to go on. You know, did Harding know? Did he not know? Did he care? Did he not care? Did he have any control over his administration? Um, who knows? The first thing I want to talk about um, with his cabinet is uh, the Teapot Dome scandal. And that should be on your packet. The Teapot Dome scandal, it's actually, um, America has what's called a strategic oil reserve which means um, we keep a certain amount of oil we keep a certain amount of oil at a couple different places in America in case there are um, crises, right? That we'll have the strategic oil reserve uh, sometimes called a strategic petroleum reserve and um, in Teapot Dome, Wyoming um, we had such a reserve and the person who was in charge of all parks in America, you know, the national parks and all of our um, Strategic Oil Reserves is Secretary of the Interior, and this guy's name was Albert Fall. And what Albert Fall did, the great part about the scandals during Harding's administration were how blatant they were. None of them were even remotely subtle. They were, they were really scandalous. And he gave businessmen, two specifically, but businessmen, the rights to use our oil, and they paid him $400,000 for his work in it. Um, he's arrested. Quietly, he, there's a trial. Um, he actually serves some prison time, and he's the first cabinet member to ever serve jail time. Um, he won't be the last, but he was the first. Um, and his name was Albert Fall. The two businessmen end up getting off for this. So Albert Fall, the Teapot Dome, um, is one of them. He he sort of secretly um, um, and indiscreetly resigns, and then ends up going to jail. Um, my favorite one is Attorney General named Harry Doherty. Harry Doherty, uh, as Attorney General, was the chief law enforcement agent of the country, right? He's in charge of uh, the Justice Department. He's going to later, the Attorney General will be in charge of the FBI. Um, and he was selling people illegally the rights to sell liquor. This is a man who's supposed to be enforcing prohibition, in fact, the chief law enforcement of prohibition, and he's selling off the rights for people. Um, to, to sell liquor. He was giving them illegal selling, uh, illegal permits, liquor permits. And he was in a uh, resigning, forced to resign, and was brought to trial, though I don't think that he went to jail. Um, although several of his advisors did end up committing suicide over the whole scandal. Harding dies in 23, not long after, you know, a couple years he'd been in office. In only two years of office, um, he had a pretty good cabinet. He had Charles Evans Hughes um, as the Secretary of State, who we had talked about before. Um, uh, during the progressive era, he was actually a pretty progressive Republican governor. Andrew Mellon as the Secretary of Treasury, um, who was supposed to be the richest guy in the country at the time. Hoover, who later became president, was his Commerce Secretary. Um, but um, in two years, Harding actually put four people in the Supreme Court, which is amazing. Uh, president Bush was president for eight years, and he only put two people in the Supreme Court. Clinton was in office for two years, and he only put two or three people, right? So, um, and Obama's put two so far. Um, what happens oftentimes, especially today, since it's so politically charged, is that liberal Supreme Court justices will wait forever before they retire until a Democrat becomes an office and then they'll retire. And if a conservative's on the bench, they'll wait for a conservative to be in office before they'll retire to maintain some sort of balance on the court. And sometimes it, you know, it, it hurts partisans or it makes our country more partisan but it also gives us some balance. So that's sort of what goes on today. So um, Harding dies and Coolidge takes over as his, um, as the president. So let's talk real quickly um, about um, the economic agenda. Coolidge was even more laissez-faire if possible than Harding. Um, he, he said very little, his nickname was Silent Cal. There was a, a story, um, he was at a party one time and they were all sitting around a table and the guy next to him said, I've got a, quite a few, quite a bit of money bet on the fact that I can get you to say more than two words this not, this evening. And Coolidge leaned over to him and he said, you lose. And that's all Coolidge said for the day. Coolidge was said to have gone in late to work, took a nap in the middle of the day, and left early. 
Um, and he said that, in fact, this is an AP question um, on one of your essays, that the, the business of the American government is business. We promote business. We don't mess around the affairs of private lives. It's all about business. And we'll get into this and, and how it actually affects um, the daily lives of individuals who are not business people. But um, as a policy, trickle-down economics becomes um, the, the process. And we've talked about this before, right? Trickle-down economics, if this is you know, society and you have the rich here and you have the poor, lots of poor down here, the idea is to give tax breaks to the rich and the whole, they will spend their money and it will trickle down to the poor, thus creating jobs for those on the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. And we, like we said before, this has happened several times in American history. This was the first time. And to give them credit, they at least cut taxes. In fact, during the 1920s, um, the uh, Bureau of the Budget was created as a way to make sure they were focusing on debt. Um, today, we cut taxes and raise spending. At least in the 20s, they cut taxes and cut spending. So there was some sort of, you know, you might not like the idea they cut taxes for the rich, but at least they didn't spend as much, so we stayed in some sort of balance budget-wise. And every time we've tried this, it really works well for the rich. It doesn't trickle down as much. And when you take AP Macro, you learn there's a reason why. In fact, there's a specific mathematical reason why. It's because when you cut taxes, there is a formula that we use to determine how much of this money actually gets put back in the economy. It's called the multiplier effect. And those people who are rich have a smaller multiplier effect than the middle class and the poor class. Because if you're rich and you get a bunch more money, you're not going to go out and spend all of it because you've already got a bunch more money. For instance, if you give me $1,000, I'm going to go spend quite a bit of it because I'm in the middle class, pseudo, and I'm going to go spend it. I've got things I can buy. Um, I can be a consumer, right? Um, I don't live paycheck to paycheck, but I'd like to have $1,000. If you give someone who's wealthy $1,000, they're already consuming at a level they're comfortable with, and they're not necessarily going to go spend it all. So this is one of the projections that sometimes is a failure or it's not a failure and they're just being lobbied by the rich to give them these tax cuts. It sort of depends on why they do it. But this is the theory of trickle-down economics and it's promoted by Andrew Mellon, the Secretary of the Treasury. So this is the basis um, of laissez-faire capitalism, which we talked about the other day, you know, um, hands off the economy, uh, let the economy go on its own. This is what, we're, this is what the 20s uh, presidents are promoting. And while we're going to see in the short run and be very, very successful, some of those institutional factors that were put in during the progressive era to make sure that the people on the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder were taken care of, they had something, um, and that the wage earners, especially lower and middle class wage earners, were increasing their wages to keep up with consumerism could work. What's going to happen is we're going to see a huge amount of production. In fact, we talked about the glorification of business, all this consumerism, but in reality, Middle class and lower class workers did not get much more money during the 20s, but they spent a lot, which means they went into debt and then eventually they couldn't buy the products they were making. And we had no um, regulatory net there to fix any of the problems that had started, and this is going to lead to the Great Depression. Um, here you can see the Supreme Court. Like I mentioned, Harding is going to put four people in the Supreme Court. All of them are uber conservative, almost what we would call reactionary, with the exception of the Chief Justice, which was Taft, who had been president. In fact, Taft is the only president that ever had gone back and been a Supreme Court Justice. In fact, his goal in life was not to be president. It was to be Supreme Court Justice. And if you think about it, he had been Secretary, I see, been Governor of the Philippines, then he had been Secretary of Defense, then he had been President, but none of those things, which are all relatively impressive things, was what he wanted to do. He wanted to be Chief Justice, which he was. And in fact, um, he was conservative, but he wasn't scary conservative. He was sort of old guard, um, country club, what we call them, conservative. And he did a pretty good job, and he was a brilliant man. But these Supreme Court justices are going to be very hostile to unions, very pro-business, um, especially as a reaction, again, to all the strikes during the first part or after World War I, leading up into the Red Scare. Um, 